Okay. Uh, my name is Captain Gary Kulibert with the Explorer's Guide Maritime Academy. What I want to do is do a review of the OUPV uh, like I do for all my classes. When I complete our exercises, all our lessons and that, I like to take the time to go through and review uh, what we covered. So I want to do the same here. What I need, I'm not going to use any PowerPoints, but what I am going to use is I want to review our books. First, I'm going to go through Coast Pilot, and then I'm going to go through Deck General and Safety, and then I'm going to do a separate one on Rules of the Road. So uh, hopefully you get your books. If not, please pause and then go get them, and then we'll start in. First thing on the Coast Pilot, both in the front and in the back, is information on aids to navigation. Everything pretty much covered in the presentation is also in those uh, two diagrams back there. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And what I want to talk about first is aids are uh, compasses, good old compasses. Um, no matter how good of a mariner you are, how well your GPS works and like, you still have to have a basic understanding of compasses. And compasses are pretty straightforward if you understand just a couple basic principles. The first thing is there's 360 degrees in a compass card and they point to magnetic north. Now our GPS uh, normally is set on true, our charts are true. So if we want to do anything per compass, we have to do that conversion. So again, the first thing we talk about is everything is true. And if I want to use the compass, let's go through the conversions itself. The magnetic compasses, what these compasses are, of course, point to magnetic north. The difference between the two of them is called variation. And variation changes geographically. So as we go around the world, uh, the, the heading towards magnetic north uh, will change, where true north is always remains the same. The magnetic north, of course, right now is moving at about 50 miles per year, and it's heading towards Siberia. So on the east and west coast, other places, your variation will change substantially over time. Where true north, again, is, is true north is where the compass points. Okay, so if we got between true and magnetic, we have variation which changes geographically, like I said, and we find the variation uh, on our charts in the compass rows. So if I ever uh, you need to know what the variation is for your area, you have to look at a current chart. And within the compass rows, it will tell you what variation, and it'll have an easterly or a westerly designation. To go from, comp uh, if, if that's all we had, was our, uh, was our um, magnetics, and we didn't have any influences on the boat, you'd be all set. But we do, we have what's called deviation. Deviation is what affects our compasses on our boats. It's our GPS, our radios, all the electronics. The, if it's a steel boat, the boat itself. So we have to correct for deviation. I'll talk about that. How do we do a deviation table in a moment? So to go from magnetic to ship's compass, we have to apply deviation. And a very important point is deviation changes with the ship's heading where variation changes with our location on the globe. And if you go to page six in your book, you're gonna see our mnemonic, TVMDC. And if we're going from true to compass, we add anything that's westerly, which will be variation and deviation will subtract easily. Well, when we wanna go from compass to true, it's just the opposite. We do compass, then deviation, and again, if it's easterly, we'll add. If it's westerly, we'll subtract. That'll get us to magnetic. We then apply variation to get us to true. So if we have a uh, dead reckoning on our chart and we want the helm to drive it as magnetic, we must convert it. Now, again, this is very simple, but it's got to be done sequentially. We do true, then variation, magnetic, deviation, and then ship's compass. It has to be done in that manner. So again, if we want to go from compass, so your helm takes a bearing, or we ask her what the heading is, and he gives it to us as for ship's compass, and I want to chart it, I have to do just the opposite. I'll do the compass. I do deviation. Again, uh, if it's easterly, I'll add. If it's westerly, I'll subtract. To get to magnetic, 
and then apply variation to get true. This is very simple, but you have to do it sequentially. You cannot jump around on it. Then we do on to page eight, and there was a number of uh, exercises there. And of course the answers are all in the back. You should be able to do those fairly straightforward. The key thing for coming up on uh, the exams and everything else is you have to know TVMDC. Okay, now let's, we talked about deviation. If you go to page 10, we talk about deviation. Again, deviation changes with the ship's heading and it's the magnetics that are on the boat that have that influence. So what I would suggest is a process here that I described where we convert our GPS to magnetic and then you take a course and then you look at the compass and you look at your uh, GPS and the difference between those two, of course, is your deviation. And again, if you're adding it to go from ship's compass to deviate uh, magnetic, it's easterly, if you subtract, it's westerly. You need to know that, not so much for what's coming up, but on your boats. One degree of air throws you off by 107 feet per mile. So if your G uh, compass is really off because of all the electronics around it, you can end up in a very bad strait. Everybody should swing their ship. This explains it. There's a table there. It's very simple, straightforward. Okay. TVMDC, we add easterly. Uh, if we're going from compass to true, if we're going from true to uh, compass, we add westerly. Again, these are for our two variables, which is variation and deviation. That's all there is to this. Again, please keep that mnemonic in mind. Let's go to page 15, publications. With our OUPV, there's not as many uh, publications that deal with, unlike our uh, inspected vessels and our ocean going scenarios. But there are four of them that you do need to know and you should be using. The first one is Coast Pilot. What Coast Pilot is, um, is our encyclopedia for an area. Today we would call it our Wikipedia, but it basically has got a ton of information uh, on an area that we should have in mind, especially if it's an area we've never been to before. Predominant features tell us as we're approaching a port, are we in the right area? Uh, trends, historical data on ice conditions, on uh, water conditions, etc. again, provide a lot of key information. So Coast Pilot, again, is a, a publication put out by NOAA. It gives us, again, this basic information which supplements our all our other information on an area. The next one is our light list. What does light list tell us? It tells us lights. If there's a buoy out there, and again, there's an exercise that we should have done. If not, please do. And on the bottom of page 16, it shows you your cl classic light list. Anytime we want to know information on a particular aid, ATONS, A2 navigation, that will be there. Uh, things like on foghorn signals. In fact, uh, 83 on our VHF turns on our fog signals or turns them off. So again, the light list gives us information on any of the aids to navigation out there. One of the key features is it gives you a lat long. So there may be a time when you need a waypoint on a particular route, and the light list will give you that for that particular aid. The other thing to note, and uh, again, it's quite uh, important, is a lot of our buoys are going away. They are being replaced by virtual AIS, Automatic Identification System, and basically it shows up on our GPS, but it does they don't exist on the water anymore. We'll talk a little about that later on. The next one is our local notice to mariners. This is a publication that you, if you're active on the water, should seriously be checking out on a monthly basis. In any book, it'll tell you where, the, where it's located. The local notice to Mariner updates all other publications. Your charts, your light list, uh, your uh, coast pilot. Uh, for example, in the latest version, it'll tell you on the Great Lakes that all the um, other buoys are not out. It'll also tell you which buoys no longer are on station or have been replaced by AIS. So again, it's a very important publication. It updates all other publications. Next, we have chart one. Chart one you can download from NOAA, and it is your legend for your charts. Uh, it explains every little squiggly line that you may have out there. 
And again, it's a good one to download on your, um, your, your device, your phone or your iPad, whatever, that you have that's available for it. The final one I want to talk about is um, the federal regulations. Uh, Code of Federal Regulations, CFRs, explain what our laws are that affect us on our boats. Uh, what equipment you have to have, what kind of uh, sea service you have to have for your licenses. So anytime we deal with regulations on our boats, our licenses and the like, it's going to be outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, it's like our administrative codes for the states, uh, our or city ordinances, whatever. But again, the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, you can access it by uh, Googling electronic CFRs, and then we're in uh, on 33 and 46 are the two codes that uh, our information is on. Again, um, Coast Pilot, Light List, uh, Local Notes to Mariners, Chart 1, and CFRs. Now, page 18 is an exercise that runs through those. If you haven't done it, I strongly suggest you do it. Okay. The next one we're going to be dealing with is aids to navigation. And for some odd reason, people are having real problems with this on our exams. And I, I've gone through a numerous times trying to figure out why. The key thing on aids to navigation is that when returning from sea, it's going to be red, even triangles on our starboard, on our right, red colors, red buoys, red lights, even numbers. And the day shapes and some of the buoys will be triangular shaped. On our port side coming and returning from sea, we got green odd squares. Colors are green, the lights and the buoys, all the numbers are odd. And again, the day shapes are square. If you remember those, that pretty much gets you through the whole process. Now, uh, return, uh, what is returning from sea? The con convectional direction of voyage, big word. It simply says that in open water, we have a, a administrative defined way of what is returning from sea. And mainly the red colored buoys are always towards the mainland. So going from uh, New Jersey down to Texas, it's going to be towards the land again. So south and west will be returning from sea in open water. On the west coast, it's from San Diego to Anchorage. Again, everything will be towards uh, the mainland. The Great Lake Lakes are either west or north, except for Lake Michigan, which is to the south. So I have to know what is returning from sea to be able to, in open water, tell which way I should pass a buoy. The reds and greens are always laterally significant. The other colors are not, which means you can go a number of different ways on them. Now, we have a bifurcated preferred channel marker. Uh, which are our banded buoys, either red over green or green over red. And that's where we have a split channel. Because we can go either way, they are lettered, they are not numbered. The top light, the top colors are primary channel. And your, the light is a group flash of two plus one. Anytime I see a flash of two plus one on a buoy, it says it's bifurcated. I can go one of two ways. One, there are three very important light frequencies we're going to talk about. That's one. The other one is safe watermarks, it's Morris code A, short, long. So the light will go short and then uh, rest, and then it will be on for a period of time, short, long. It means safe water. We can come in on either side of that buoy. It lines us up with the main channels that we're entering on it. It's vertically striped, red and white. Again, if you go in the front of the book, and if you put this on pause, go to the front of the book, you'll see those listed there. The other one is quick flash. So it's flashing uh, rapidly, and it simply means change ahead. It does not say danger. It doesn't say much of anything else except look at me. I'm important. There's something going to happen up here. So again, those are the three flashes that we have. And again, they're in the end of the book here, end of this chapter, as well as under the front cover. The other one is the um, intercoastal water system which runs between the mainland and the barrier islands along the east coast. Uh, anything to do with the ICW, intercoastal waterway, is yellow. Yellow squares, yellow triangles indicate that you're on the intercoastal waterway. 
Uh, any uh, buoys, large buoys out there that are yellow also indicate uh, everything but safe navigation, uh, our lateral system. Their weather buoys, their uh, anchorage areas, et cetera. Okay, now I'm going to talk just briefly about locking through. Uh, many of the areas of the country have uh, lock systems, and usually on the lock system, there'll be three lights. There'll be a red light, an amber light, and a green. Red says lock is closed, do not enter. Am amber says it's partially open, and a full green light means come on in. Again, the lock master will be directing you in. Normally with locks, uh, they will monitor channels 13 and 14. More about that later. On page 31, you'll see the three light frequencies I've been talking about. And again, returning from sea, going out to sea, uh, those are the things that you need to be safe on the water. Very safe on the water. This is very important of them. Uh, the other thing is that there's some confusion. I don't understand why. When we return from sea, the numbers on the buoys increase as we go up into the, the harbor if we go up into a river system. As we come down, they decrease. Green one, red two are out at the entrance. They're not someplace up the system. Okay. And again, on page 32, there's a work exercise you should have done. So those give us our base. Uh, they tell us about aids to navigation, our publications, and our compasses. Now we're going to get into the charts themselves. And again, we talked about the uh, latitudes, longitude, degrees. Again, there's 360 degrees in a circle. 60, uh, one degree is 60 minutes. And one minute, of course, is uh, uh, the 60 minutes and, a degree, and um, again, the degree. Our nautical miles uh, will be the same. So one degree will have 60 nautical miles. Therefore, one minute is one nautical mile. A nautical mile is 6,076 feet. Okay, very straightforward, but something that you really need to, to keep in mind. Uh, charts in the lower left corner will be the chart number. It's a couple other places, but also all the dates has been corrected. Local Norse Mariners, as well as uh, Norse to Mariners on those. The other thing is when we plot, you do not use the longitude scale, you use the latitude scale. And again, one minute on the latitude scale is one nautical mile. That is broken down into tenths, the small marks. And what we do is when we measure distances and the like, it's down to a tenth. Okay. Again, the uh, variation is printed in the middle of the compass rows. We talked about that a number of times. When you look at your chart, that's the first thing you should look at to give you again what the variation will be in that area. Um, okay. Now, page 39, dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is uh, our course from a point, a known fix. A fix is a, um, a location of high degree of accuracy, celestial, terrestrial, GPS, but we know for sure that it's there. All dead reckonings, DR, start from a fix, a high degree of accuracy. And then from there, we're going to go speed, time, and distance. And I strongly suggest you use 60D Street. It's drawn out on page 39. Uh, the reason I suggest it, it helps you solve any of the problems. On page 40, actually, where you can pencil them in, we go through five examples there. If you haven't done them, you should do them. Again, the idea is that I put in what I know and what I don't know is what we're solving for. So if I know I'm going from point A to point B, I can measure the distance. Put it on under, uh, under D. Uh, then I'm going to give you a speed or time. Time, a lot of times, will be clock times. You started at 1,000 hours and you got there at... 11.30, well, how many minutes? Basically 90 minutes. You plug it in and do the math. Okay. Um, and on 40 and in 41, we go through what a, a heading is, dead reckoning, a position, a fix, again, high degree of accuracy, a line of position, a single compass bearing. Those are terms you should at least review. Okay. 42. 42, to me, has been very frustrating with our students because it's very simple. A relative bearing is a bearing taken from the front of the boat, and then you simply add it to the ship's 
heading, be it the ship's heading being for a ship's compass or be it true. You're out in the front of the boat, you don't have a compass, and you see something off in the distance, you see a light. And you kind of pretty much estimate um, with the front of the boat being zero, 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 where that light is. You know, that 40, 40, 45 degrees, 90 degrees if it's a beam, 180 if it's behind, whatever. And you report that to the helm. Well, they simply do is take what you gave them as a relative bearing and add it to the ship's heading. If you're using GPS, you simply add it to the GPS, and that is a bearing to that object. That's all it gives you. So it gives me a, a, a bearing to an object. I can chart it if I need to. I know where I'm looking for it, but that all there is to it. And for some odd reason, people forget that, and it's do it at your own risk. If it's over 360 degrees, obviously we don't have more than 360 degrees. We simply subtract 360 to get a true um, a true bearing to that object. There are 40, on 43, there are six little exercises. And again, um, I would make sure you have a good understanding of what relative bearings are. On 43, there's 21 problems on 60D Street. Um, if you can do those without a problem, uh, great. If you can't, I would strongly, very strongly suggest you go back and make sure, draw it 60 D Street, put in that information, because you are going to need to know that, not only on the water, but also on coming up on the exams. You're going to need to know it. On 44, we talk about fixes. This is where we start applying our data. What a true fix is, relative, again, relative is to the front of the boat, a compass, our headings. And again, one degree is... 60 minutes, which is 60 nautical miles. One minute is one nautical mile, 6,076 feet. Pretty straightforward. On dividers, uh, hopefully Chris showed you how to use a divider to measure distances. Basically, you go between your two points. You walk it over to the scale on the la latitude, not longitude. And you go on a full number, and then you can read up how many full units as well as how many tens. A very simple way of doing them. And then you had exercise um, 10 and 11 there, which works you through on uh, 11 by 17 sheets, basically drawing a line between two points, doing a bearing. And what you do with the bearing, again, you're taking your rolling rulers on the line, pulling it down to the compass rows, and reading through that little dot in the center, and you read the outer part of the rows. Because the outer part is true, that's what we're dealing with. We don't deal with magnetic. On it. Okay, 46, line of position. Taking a bearing on a charted object and convert it to true, or if it's true, you just plot it. So anytime I take my hand compass, I look at an object, and I take a bearing, that is a line of position. And what we do is we put our lines of positions together for our three-point fix. Again, again, a fix is a high degree of accuracy, celestial, terrestrial, uh, electronic, that's where we always start. Then we talked about our three-point fixes, and hopefully you've done a number of those on 11 by 17s on it. Uh, writing fixes and set and drift, we're going to put off to the side for now. Uh, set and drift is fairly simple on the bottom of page 51. It's a formula again. And when you follow the six points, you can't go wrong. Every time I've had people with problems with set and drift, it's because they did not do it sequentially. We have a location. We're at our location, if you look in the, again in your book, at 800, we have a fix. We do that location, we draw a line, which is our course and our speed. We do a formula to determine where we are on it. We traveled for 20 minutes at 10 knots. Where are we on our, our line of position? You mark that first. Then you find out you're not there, you're someplace else, you mark that location. You draw a line to that from where we think we are to there. That's your set. We measure that distance and do the formula. That's your drift. Remember now, set is direction. Drift is speed. Current is water in motion. Okay. Now, the last one I have here, again, is very simple. And sometimes I don't understand quite how guys mess it up. Distance off. You're out tooling along, you have your DR, and you want to find out how far off you're going to clear a particular rock pile. Well, you got your your DR, you got where your location, 
and you got your line. So you're just drawing that. When you find that rock pile on your chart, you simply draw a line perpendicular to your course line. Well, that perpendicular is your closest, closest point of approach to that object. You can measure that, and it tells you how far off you are. You are not going there. You're going by it, but that's your distance off from that object. If I ask you for an ETA to that, again, it's not going to that object, but when it is a beam or, or perpendicular to our course. So you measure from our start position at 10 hundred hours, and we find out at uh, 12 miles up the road that we're going to be uh, our distance off. You can look at the example I have there. We measure that, that distance. We find it's 12 miles. We go right to 60D Street, 60 times D divided by our time or our speed, we are speed because we're looking for time, gives us how many minutes before we reach our closest point of approach. Again, on page 54, it really lays it out nicely. It's two lines and many times one formula. Okay. The, um, I'm not gonna dwell on AIS here, but I strongly, strongly suggest you go to NAVCEN, N-A-V-C-E-N dot U-S-C-G dot gov. That is the navigation site that the Coast Guard po uh, posts all their information. And on the left side, you will see AIS, and it's going to explain it. If you have not dealt with it, it's very important because, like I say, the buoys on the bodies of water, especially the Great Lakes, are gone or, or going to be gone. Many of them are. And AIS is what's really there. On the bottom of page 62, uh, it tells you about uh, marinetraffic.com. It shows you what we're talking about, AIS, both on the boats as well as the buoys themselves. Okay. Page 63, tides. Tides basically are vertical. They go up, they come down. Currents are the ones that are horizontal. So a current will come in and flood or ebb and pass out. Tides are vertical, currents are horizontal, pretty straightforward. And again, depend upon where the moon is and the moon in relationship to the sun, we have either a nep tide or a spring tide. Again, on page 63, spring tides are when the moon and sun are in alignment, or especially if they're on the same side of the earth, uh, we have our spring tides, and as we go down the quarters, we are in our nep tide. Our highs are not quite as high, and our lows are not quite as low. Tides are vertical. Currents are horizontal. They flood. They ebb. And then we have our two tides. On 64, it shows you the various types of tide cycles. Our normal is a semi diurnal normally two highs, two lows, with one of them being a little bit higher than the other and a, low, a little bit lower than the other. Okay. 63, our charted depths for ocean charts are based on mean lower low water reference. What that means is that they have their instrumentations out there. And just like I said, on the semi diurnal, there's two highs, two lows, one being a little bit more pronounced. Well, the lower of those lows is averaged out about over 19 years. And then what they do is that's all the elevations is based on that. So when I look at a chart for uh, Long Island Sound, and I see 77, it says basically, normally you'll have a minimum of 77 feet, but uh, whatever tidal height I have, I simply add to that. The lakes are um, established uh, datum. For example, over here, uh, Lake Michigan is 577.5. Lake Erie will be a little bit lower. Lake Ontario quite a bit lower, but those are established. So when you look at local nose to mariners, it says that lakes are up you know, 48 inches is from that datum is what they're up. Okay. Again, uh, tides, I tidal, uh, tide table is what I use to determine tidal height. And the tidal current table is what I use to uh, determine the direction and the speed of the currents on it. Remember now, set is direction, drift is speed, and currents, water in motion is called current. And there's a little example, uh, exercise on page 68. Um, one little error on that is that when I uh, put the last graph in, it slipped and it covered up uh, the set and drift for the currents on it. So you can't answer that question. 
Okay, the last one I have here is weather. And basically, the first part of the presentation talked about global weather systems. Most of our weather, again, is generated by the heat of the sun, depending upon where it is. Uh, we got down to pressure gradients on our charts, weather charts. Gradient is from a high pressure to a low. The steeper the gradient, the stronger the winds are. And those are represented by the isobars. Isobars are bars of equal pressure. The tighter the bars are together, the stronger the winds. And again, they're wrapping around those lows and highs. And again, pressure gradient tells us the steepness of it. If it's very mild, the winds are light. If it's very steep, again, the winds are very strong. We use an anonymeter for measuring speed of the wind and direction. Barometer does atmospheric pressures, the rising and falling barometers. We went through a number of clouds, but the, really the key cloud is cirrus. Cirrus are those high weather clouds, those wispy clouds. Uh, as they change and fill in, you get storms. We had that last night. We had some beautiful uh, blue skies with cirrus clouds. And over the course of time, uh, by sunset, they've pretty much filled in. And this morning, we got some pretty good thunderstorms. So again, cirrus clouds tell us that weather is changing. And if they fill in, you're going to get the rains or snows. Finally, down on the bottom of 73, we talk about backing and veering. Very important in weather reports. If the low goes south of you, the winds are going to back around. They're going to go from east to north to west. If the low is north of you, the winds are going to go just the opposite. They're going to veer around east, south, especially southwest. And as the cold front passes, they're going to veer around to the west and back to the north. When the low, uh, low passes, uh, barometers rise, temps drop, veers go to the west, northwest. As the high eventually passes over, uh, if it, as high as north of us, we're going to see those winds again go from the north to the uh, east. And we'll start having a winds out of the east for that period until it starts all over on it. Okay. Now on page 79 and 80 are examples of uh, plotting. You know, I'm going to go back through, there's six problems here, and I just want to briefly go through them. The first one says you are leaving um, RW at a heading at 10 knots, and once you know your distance off a rock pile. So what do we have? We have a fix, right? RW. We have a course heading, a DR of uh, 105, and we have speed. So at 1100 hours you left, and you wanna know when the distance off the rock pile. Well, you draw your DR, you find the rock pile, you're doing a 90 degree angle from your DR to that rock pile. That tells you your distance off. When I ask you what your ETA is, expected time of arrival, you're measuring from your start point to that DR. That gives you distance times 60 divided by your speed of 10 knots. And it'll give you your time. It's simple. Second one's a three-point fix. You should come out pretty much right on. Now, when I read latitude and longitude, this is very important. What I will do is I read from right to left, bottom to top. And the reason for that is I'm going up. If I read the opposite way, I'm trying to subtract, and you won't do it. You're going to get wrong answers. So always read from bottom up and, again, right to left. Now, I don't have my rolling ruler right here, but the very important thing is when I measure, I want to line it up on one of the meridians, the longitude or latitude, making sure it's very straight, and then I'll move it over. And then, again, I'm going to read from right to left, bottom to top on it. It's the easiest way to uh, do it so you get very correct answers. And your ruler has got to be perfectly north, south, or east, west so that you can make those readings on it. Okay. Uh, third one down, GPS, that long. Again, a second one. Basically, you got two locations. You're drawing your line, and then you're using your rulers to find out what your heading is on that measure your distance, and then by the distance, I can do 60 D Street for my speed made good. Okay, fourth one down. What chart would you use to enter Connecticut River? On your charts, 
the charts that support that of better scales are always embedded in those areas and you see the chart numbers. So if you look uh, in the Connecticut River, you're gonna see two different chart numbers there. Those are the charts that I would use to enter that river. Okay, uh, a range line. There's a couple range lines, one off of Jefferson on the western side of the chart, one off of uh, uh, New Haven. Anytime I see a range line, remember I'm going into the river system, I can simply tell the heading on those by grabbing that range line, running over to the compass road, making sure I read the right side, the correct side. And again, remember these readings are as true, not per ship's compass or relative. Okay. Um, number six, relative bearing. Again, really ser uh, simple. You're leaving RWNH at uh, heading of uh, 230, true. I can draw that line. I'm going to be going 10 knots, and I want to know where I'm going to be at 10.15. So I've been on there 15 minutes. So I'm going to take uh, my, my speed of 12 times 15 minutes divided by 60 will tell me how far I should, I've been on that uh, DR. Find that distance, mark it. The problem then goes on. Again, we're doing this in steps. If you do it in steps, you're fine. If you don't, you ain't going to pass. Your lookout reports a light at 049 relative. Got an R on it. All I simply do is take my 230 plus 49, gives me 279 as a uh, 279 true. From that spot that I just calculated, I determine a heading at 279, and that's going to lead you right to that light. Again, a location, our DR, our formula to where I am at the time of the problem. And then I have a, a relative bearing. I simply add that to my ship's heading. And then I find it and draw a line, and that's the answer. That's the way it is. It's literally that simple. But you got to do it sequentially. If you don't, you're, you're not going to get a right answer. Okay. So, again, uh, those, that's NAV General. Uh, there's 10 questions on the chart. And there's 50 questions on the uh, navigation, of which you have to have 35 right. Uh, when you do the exams, my, I get a couple words of advice. Read the question. And I mean, don't skip through. If you're a skimmer, you've got problems. You've got to read every word within that. Then read all four answers before you pick a right answer. You pick it, you leave it. Do not change it unless you're very, very sure you have a wrong answer. I've had too many guys flunk because they answered all the right questions and they went back and changed them to all the wrong answers. Don't do that. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and do um, deck. Deck is, again, a 50-question exam, uh, 30 questions. 50 questions, you got to get 35 right. Okay. In your book, First area was we talked about our applications. Your license is good for five years. Fourth year you start. On our website, under explorersguidellc.com, you go to application help. There are all the videos. All that stuff will help you get through the process. The second part on uh, page nine is regulations for inspected vessels. Pretty straightforward. We know we have to have life preservers, one for each person on board the boat. So if you got two people and two crew, that's four. You got to have four type ones. They are readily accessible. They turn an unconscious person over 95% of the time. If our uh, boat is 26 feet or longer, we have a life ring that's immediately uh, available. Light, life jackets are readily, life rings are immediately. Personal flotation light. If you're on tidal waters, Great Lakes, you'll have a personal flotation light on the life jacket. They are required, and they will have a battery or they will be sealed. They will have an expiration date when you change them before they're expired. Uh, a lot of the batteries are for 10 years. If it's been used, then it should be replaced. Unlike flares, flares are every 42 months. Batteries are prior to their expiration. Visual distress, many, many combinations. Um, they are red in color, most of them, uh, except for orange smoke, and they are expire again in 42 months. We went through uh, effective sound making device. 
under 12 meters, you got to have a device that makes the proper signals. And we simply refer to it as effective sound making device. Yes, it may be a bell, a whistle, a lot of things. But under 12, the code is very specific. We call it an effective sound making device. Nav lights, fire extinguishers, all boats will have at least one B1 on board. 26 feet or more will have two. If you have a electric, electric, I wish. Uh, if we had gasoline inboard engines, uh, they'll have a backflash flame arrestor on the gasoline carburetor. Diesels do not have carburetors, therefore they are not on diesels, only on gas and on inboards. We went through the various fuels. Gasoline cannot be used for anything such as heating, lighting, cooking. It can only be used as uh, propulsion fuel. And on page 12, we go through all the various things that are required on our boats. Pretty straightforward. Our, our OUPVs, basically, you get seven items you need on them. Uh, then I talk a little bit about Code of Federal Regulation, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Pollution. They really, really simplified it. Um, in 19, uh, 2013, MARPOL was changed. And basically, nothing gets to disposed overboard, period. What do we dispose on the Great Lakes? Nothing. Then we go on to page 16. Outside of special areas greater than three nautical miles from land. And we're talking the ocean. We're not talking inland. So from zero to three, which is state-owned, nothing. From three to 12 nautical miles out, food waste ground down to one inch. Your chicken bones, uh, that type of stuff. No garbage, no refuse, no plastic, no paper. It's just food waste. From 12 on out, any food waste, cargo residue, not harmful to the environment. Cleaning agents, not harmful to the environment. And at 100 miles out, you're dead cow. So nothing within three, three to 12, ground up food waste. Again, it's food waste. 12 on out, food waste, cargo residue, and cleaning agents not harmful to the environment, and any animal carcasses 100 miles out. Pretty straightforward. Then we talk about sanitary waste. Type one, type two, type three treatment plants. Basically, a type three treatment plant is our holding tanks, our porta potties, and the like. Nothing inland is disposed of. Again, now when you get beyond three miles, the coast pilot will tell you what can and cannot be dumped. That's where the coast pilot really comes in on it. Uh, if you have the ability to uh, bypass sewage on your boat, that bypass valve must be closed, handle removed, non releasable wire tie, uh, or um, yeah, non releasable wire tie, handle removed, or locked. And that's on page 18. 19. Your certificate of documentation or boat registration title tells you who owns the boat. Five, uh, five gross tons for documentation under the federal processes. Uh, and again, there's some information here that I list. Best thing to go is to their site. Uh, any documented boat that's commercial will have the name and hailing port on the back, names on the bow. Your documentation number will be placed in a very easily seen place and in a manner that if removed, leaves scarring. Okay. Then we got talking about Marlin Spike. A lot of neat things there. A couple highlights. Um, nylon. Nylon is a great line, but it stretches. It comes back together. However, the biggest danger of nylon is snapback. If it breaks while it's stretched, it has a lot of kinetic energy and it can cause some serious injury. But nylon also is a very good line to have as your anchor line as it kind of smooths out the jerking around on it. We talked about uh, inspection of your lines, uh, especially around uh, eyes. Talked about basic maintenance. Safe working level, SWL. We have a breaking strength of a line, but a safe working level, what we can load up to, uh, for us is 20%. 1,000 pound breaking strength, you can put 20, uh, 200 pounds of working load on that line. And again, it's for uh, safety factors and alike. So SWL for us is 20%. Knots, all kinds of neat things in knots. Uh, figure eights, square knots. Bowling. Bowling puts a temporary uh, loop in the end of a line. It's a, a very diversified knot. We use it in many different ways, and it's a good one to learn how to tie on it. We have a becket. We have a single, uh, double becket where we go around twice. 
synthetic lines are very slippery, so we use that um, to hold them. Now, Beckett is used for two lines of unequal size, where square knot is used for two lines of equal size. Then we talk about splices, our shackles, safety shackles, which has the ability to insert a um, pin in it, uh, usually seizing wire, stainless, small stainless steel, um, or aluminum, so that pin does not work loose, very important. Uh, dip in the eye, if you have two lines on a single ballot, you really need to make sure you dip the eye, you come inside and up, so both people can get off, otherwise you may find your boat floating at night. Because either they cut the line or they let it go, so make sure you dip your eyes on those. Okay. Temporary pairs. There's a chart on page 34. Very important. We prepare, we assess, we control. Again, we have to think of every way water or fires can happen, how we prepare our, our catch for that. When it happens, we do the proper assessment, and we do the best we can to control it before abandoning ship. Through damage control, leaks and other are either stopped or reduced to where the pumps will keep up to them. So again, our whole point is to minimize the amount of water coming in uh, so that our pumps can keep up or until we can properly abandon ship, depending upon the scenario of it. And again, uh, temporary pairs, we fight fires first, end the flooding second, and do whatever we can to get back to shore third. That is our priority in it. And then we talked about various ways of, of doing just that. Abandoned ship. Even though you are not required to do the drills, you cannot be considered a prudent mariner without without it. You should be talking to your crew and say, okay, if we have to abandon ship, what are we going to do? Who does what? Where's the equipment, et cetera? And then log it. Because if there ever is an accident, your ability to defend yourself is the ability to show that you, in fact, did the drills on that. It's very important before we abandon ship, to vigorously and proficiently fight fires, repair damages, etc. The point is, it better be better. Uh, is it better to be in the water than on the boat? If it's better to be on the boat, why are you in the water? So basically, when you abandon ship, it's at that last resort when you're going to have to do it. But again, the drills are very important. Um, if we have to have uh, our life rafts, we go through the various ways of launching our life rafts, either manually or automatically there's a painter a more a line on the rafts we always make sure it's tied down to something sturdy on the boat for two reasons if the boat sinks the raft will float up that line will, will pop the pin and it'll inflate if you manually do it that then is adhered to the boat it won't drift away because if it drifts away it's gone so it's very important to, again it be properly secured if the raft is launched and is upside down we get on the cylinder side of the raft, use the writing straps, and flip it over. It's sim that simple on it. EPIRBs. Uh, if you happen to have an EPIRB on the boat, they're designed that if the boat sinks, that they will float free and immediately begin transmitting the signal. If you have an EPIRB, they are supposed to be checked on a monthly basis. Okay. Um, fresh water is not as important, but if you abandon ship in salt water, one of the big things we do not do is mix our drinking water with salt water urine or anything else because the electrolytes in that will kill you a lot faster than um, through uh, thirst. Okay, a lot of good information in those areas. I just doing a quick highlight. Uh, 40, or page 4 rather, 4D. Um, man overboard. Again, it's the same thing. If you have not done the drills and you have an incident and somebody dies, you're going to have a hard time explaining to the U.S. Coast Guard why you do not recover that person. What you do is you got to make sure you do the drills. Make sure your crew knows where the equipment is, their duties, and how to do it. The primary things is when you have a man overboard, you holler to the helm which side they went over. The helm then will get the stern away from the victim in the water by turning the direction in which the person fell over. The boats pivot one-third back. The stern will pivot away from them. So you get the stern away, you mark the spot, you post a lookout. Then you go through your recovery process. And we talked about the uh, circle, the Anderson turn or the, or the circle turn and the Williamson turns. 
and we talked about different ways of getting the person in the boat. And remember, if you take them out, you got to bring them back. If they fall in the water, you got to get them out safely and bring them back. Okay. Uh, then we went through life-saving equipment. Uh, in this day and age now with the bloodborne pathogens and the viruses around, you have to make sure you have a proper kit on board to protect yourself, especially if somebody throws up, has then released the bodily fluids, bleeding, whatever. And uh, you got to take this very seriously because it's your life on it. Okay. Safety orientation, page 47. And again, I'm doing a, a brief synopsis here. You must do a briefing, and the master of the vessel must provide a short safety briefing uh, before you leave the dock. Get into a routine. Uh, something you don't do them. People don't wear life jackets are, and you have an incident. Uh, you've got some very serious problems. The safety orientation is mandatory. Then make sure you do it. And the master of the vessel is responsible for it. Then we got into serious marine incidents. A marine casualty is damages, I think it's from $75,000 on up to $200,000. A serious marine incident is loss of life, injury beyond first aid, crew member cannot report for duty, and $200,000. You must notify the OCMI, the officer in charge, immediately. And then you got to do the two-hour alcohol test, the 32-hour drug test and file your written report within five days of it. Very serious situations. Uh, on page 48 and 49, we go through that. I uh, talk about the different types of uh, drugs you have to, uh, testing you have to do, pre-employment, serious marine incident, reasonable cause to be directed by either law enforcement or your employer, uh, ordered by law enforcement, and the random drug testing program. Everybody on the boat has to be part of a random drug testing program crew because it's required by law and if you're not and they find out about it the going fine is four thousand dollars and they are enforcing it on it when do you have to lend assistance without serious da danger to you the vessel or people on the board you are required to provide assistance at sea if a person is being danger to being lost with those conditions but we don't rescue Property, we rescue people. Okay. Go through a bunch on the drug programs. There's a lot on um, drugs out there now. 57, radio communications. Basically, we got three three calls, Mayday, Pompon, -pom, and Security. Mayday, boat's going down. In a very serious situation, basically, the ship is being lost at sea. Pompon -pom is an urgent message on health, safety, you have flooding, but you're not quite ready to abandon ship, those types of things. And then security is anything to do with safe navigation or the weather. We must listen to channel 16 when we're underway. Uh, I have a list of channels on 60. Um, then on page 62, some very important channels. 13 is bridge to bridge. If you're out there and you wanna to talk to that big ore carrier or whatever, you go down to channel 13 because most likely 16 they're not listening to. And again, it's only to do with navigation, um, but if you need to get a hold of them, 13 is a good channel to go with. 83 turns on fog signals. 70, they just select. No one talks on that. It's all uh, digital notification stuff. Uh, 63, small craft virus series on the Great Lakes and uh, inland waters 22 to 33. You get out in the ocean, it's a little bit different from that. On page 65, we talk a little bit about fueling. It goes through the 18 steps, and quite frankly, those are very 18 good steps, especially having no one on the boat and it's properly secure. Um, 14 says, turn on blowers from one complete air exchange. Many boats get blown up because they don't turn on the blowers and you run it for one complete air exchange because it varies from boat to boat because of the size of the boats on it. Uh, you got to make sure you do that. Bad things happen. Batteries are another one. Batteries, when they're used or discharged, generate hydrogen. You want to make sure, and it's lighter than air, you want to make sure you never have sparks around a battery and that it's properly ventilated. 
because it will um, it will blow up. Uh, wiring use multi strand, not residential wiring. And again, everything is sized with the fuses so that the wire does not short out, but the fuse is uh, blown. Again, common sense stuff, but uh, it's not followed. 71, fires. A lot of very interesting things on fires. We have our uh, fire tetrahedron, fuel, heat, and oxygen. And then the exel, chemical exothermic reaction is the fourth part of it. Um, a, B, C, D, what do we have those for? To tell us what extinguisher to use. A is ash, is the only one we ever use water on. B is flammable liquids, that's where we have our ABC fire extinguisher. C is electrical. Once we have electrical fires, um, what do we do? We turn off the power. We no longer have electrical fire, now it's just an A fire. And D is combustible metals. Talk about various things on fire. Um, then we get down to how fire is spread in a boat. Spread in a boat, spread in a house, out in a, a forest fire, it doesn't make any difference. Convection, it rises, goes up through the structure of the boat. Conduction is through the hull, through the uh, walls and that. And then uh, we have radiation, it's just like the big old bonfire where it radiates, heats up, gets it hot enough, we have the release of gases, and expands the fire on it. So again, A, B, C, D fires, extinguishers, conductive, uh, convection, radiation. And I think we're, uh, we know by now, we better know by now, the right side of the boat's the starboard, the left side's port, we have a bow, we have a stern, and the largest part of the boat at a 90 degree angle is a beam. Uh, pitch of a prop, one cycle is how far it can go, and propping a boat is can be pretty complicated. That's why we work with the expert on it. One rotation of a prop, theoretically pushing us through the water without slip, is the pitch on it. And as we all know, we have to have enough water flowing over the rudder for the boat to steer, otherwise it does not. On 82, 81, excuse me, we're talking about bank suction, bank cushion, uh, et cetera. Bank suction is basically any boat in a displacement mode has a bow wave. When it hits up against something, it has the pressure to push us out. On the stern, our props are pulling out a lot of water. As that water's pulled out, it causes more of a low pressure between us and the bank, it tends to pull the, bank, the back of the boat towards the bank, bank suction, bank cushion. And on bigger boats, we have to make sure we account for that. Very important. Advanced transfer head reach are, are, are basically how uh, far the turn will go for the uh, to make a complete turn. I equate that to your uh, pickup truck in a boutique parking lot. How it's hard to find, uh, be able to park because uh, the spots are too close together and there's not enough turn. That's advanced transfer. We see that every day. Uh, when we drive our vehicles on it. Same thing on the water. Okay. Anchoring, holding power. Horizontal pressure to pull an anchor out, that strain is our holding power. And that depends upon the size of the flukes of our anchor. The more we can dig that anchor in, the deeper it goes, the sharper that angle, the more holding power we have. Our goal is to bury that anchor the, the, as much as we can where the flukes are covering, covering as much dirt as we can so they have the best holding power. They gotta dig in. If they can't dig in, they're not gonna hold. Anchor road is from the line attachment point on the anchor, the chain, all the way up to the line that attaches to the boat. Okay. On 85, I'm talking about um, ratios. How much scope do we leave out? Uh, five to one, it basically one vertical for five horizontal is when you're out there just having, you know, you're fishing, you're having lunch, whatever. Overnight, seven to one, heavy weather, 10 to one. And I'll tell you, based on past experiences, those ratios are very real on it. If your anchor, when you start anchoring and set the anchor, if it does not hold, what do you do? You let out more anchor line. If not, then you have to raise it and start all over. But the first thing we do is let out more anchor line. On uh, 86, we're talking about our different lines. Uh, some people go by numbers, most people go by names, your bow line. Stern line, again. Basically on the stern line, um, and I got a couple of minutes here and then I got to scoot. 
Uh, basically, it runs from the front of the boat parallel to the boat to hold it in reduced motion parallel. Your breast lines is perpendicular to the boat. And that should pretty much take us through those two. Okay, I'm going to post this shortly, and then uh, we will do the one on the rules of the road. Uh, hopefully you found this very helpful. Take care and good luck.